Let's ask the expert. Thank you, Dibs. I as thought I we mentioned, just did. Associate Professor of, uh, of <laughs> Orthopedic you. Surgery, Dr. Nirav Pandya. Uh, doctor, uh, happy Thanksgiving. Great to be with you. I just, if we may, is could there be any truth to that? A listener suggesting that, you know, Jimmy, maybe he's more accurate this year because of the surgery that he had. Does that medically make any sense, sir? It, there actually is, is a possibility for that. And, and I think we look back at, you know, kind of you look at pitchers who undergo UCL reconstruction and there's thought that you get Tommy John surgery and you throw better. And it's not necessarily the surgery, but it's the rehab that you do. So for Jimmy, this may be one period of time in his potentially his entire career where someone actually looked at his mechanics, he strengthened his shoulder up, and he actually came back more accurate because he actually was forced to look at those things. So there absolutely is a possibility that coming off this shoulder surgery, the little subtle things that may be affecting his accuracy, affecting his arm strength, he actually had time to work on it, um, and he's better for it. So absolutely that is a possibility. And then there's also been talk that he had the opportunity to work diligently on his lower body as he recovered because he couldn't throw for a while, and that obviously could also have a huge positive impact on his overall mechanics, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. And I think with a lot of throwers, particularly when, when kids are at the high school, college level, what ends up happening is where, you know, we're like, look, you need to concentrate on your lower extremity, and they've done all this upper extremity work. And actually, most of the throwing motion comes from the strength in your lower extremity. So absolutely, like, you know, coming off his ACL, he had that high ankle sprain, um, who knows what was going on with his mechanics, you know, at that point. So finally kind of forced him to shut down, work on the lower extremity, work on the upper extremity. And clearly with the way he's playing right now, um, there has to be some sort of, you know, relationship to his rehab. Yeah. And Jimmy Garoppolo has been playing solid. Hopefully he can stay healthy and keep this Niner train rolling. One player who hasn't been out there, Eric Armstead. What's the latest on his variety of foot maladies? Yeah, so, uh, you know, with the plantar fasciitis on one side and this quote-unquote hairline small crack fracture on the other side, he's definitely within the time frame where you'd expect the bone to be healed. Now, I think the larger issue is going to be, number one, this, this plantar fasciitis. And then number two, you know, they're trying to be extra cautious most likely to make sure that something else doesn't pop out. I mean, we're not 100% sure if the plantar fasciitis led to this hairline fracture or this hairline fracture was there and led to plantar fasciitis. So I think with the team playing so well, with him being such an important player, I think you extend out that time that even though he may be technically healed, per se, you want to make sure he doesn't develop second, something secondarily that then impacts him as the season goes on. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're a little bit more cautious, and even though he may be ready if this were a playoff game next week, um, they would be more likely to wait a week or two. But um, I think he's definitely in the time frame to be structurally healed. The question is, is his function there, and he's not compensating. Doc, as someone with a medical background, I my wife works at a hospital, my mother did, and I've actually been to a hospital. So as someone with a medical background, I have to ask you, when you, you mentioned the hairline fracture, you said, quote, unquote, medi- uh, hairline fracture. Why did why did you qualify it that way? You know, because I think a lot of people, they you know, when they use hairline, they kind of mean a lot of different things. They can say like, oh, it's just a tiny little crack, or it's like a big crack, and it's not out of place. Um, you know, it's a term that's used a lot. It's kind of like, some people say, it's, you know, is my bone fractured or is it broken? I'm like, it's all kind of these terms mm. that get thrown out there. So, you know, the, the medical definition of a hairline is a small crack in the bone that doesn't go all the way through. Um, but, you know, when people say that, a lot of it also depends not just on what it looks like, but where it is. So you have a hairline fracture in a very important high stress place. It can take 8 to 12 weeks to get back versus, a you know, a fracture that may be bigger but in a not important place. So um, I think that term is thrown around a lot, but um, there is, you know, a strict definition that we have to kind of make sure is there. Yeah, I think that too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Doc, one thing we talk about is load management in the NBA, and Whitey was making the, the point earlier and asking the question of whether or not it's actual science or is it just kind of an urban myth. Where do you think load management plays a role in the NBA? I think it absolutely does, and I, and I think when you know the biggest argument you hear, you, everyone goes back to like the '80s and '90s, and you know talked about all these players who played you know 82 games and never took a night off. I mean, I think number one is that if you look at today's typical NBA player, they've come into the league already with a lot more load, kind of wear and tear on their bodies. A lot of it has to do with you know playing year-round basketball at ages eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. So you have a different athlete coming into the league. And then when you look at the actual data for load management, you actually do see that it decreases injury risk. So there was a study done a couple years ago where they looked at all the NBA players, looked at rest, looked at increased minutes, and you actually found that for each day of rest that players had that went above and beyond their normal schedule, it actually decreased injury risk by about 16%. Hmm. Um, So it's very powerful in that sense. And then if you look at actual minutes, and a lot of people will say, well, you know, if they play a lot of minutes one game, should they be resting the next day? 
actually what most of these NBA teams are probably doing is looking at the cluster of minutes over the past three, five, or ten games. So if you have a ten-game period where you have a lot of minutes played, that's where you need to get in that rest. Or if you're coming off an injury like Clay, um, you want to kind of decrease that load. So absolutely, I think there is some science behind it. I think where it becomes a little bit fuzzier, it's where, you know, well, they haven't played a lot, or suddenly it's like yeah. a, a not important game. You know, that's where it gets a little bit more, more uh, you know, kind of sketchy. But I think there definitely is data to suggest that with today's NBA player, it can help. Yeah, I think uh, we've come a long ways. I would suggest that the guys in the 80s might have benefited from from the same type of you know, approach. Uh, I mean, people now look at it and go, well, players are still getting hurt. Therefore, load management, it doesn't work. When it's what we have no idea what the injury picture would be like if we didn't have that. So I understand why people don't like it because you want to see players play, but I think it's a better product as a result of having that. Doc Pandia with us. I want to ask you about Clay. And we know Clay, the last couple of games, has played much better, as you well know. Um, but we know that during the offseason, he really struggled with the idea of scrimmaging. There was kind of a mental hurdle, apparently, about scrimmaging because that's where he, he got hurt. So with all the advances in sports medicine physically, Doc, have we also seen similar advances when it comes to sports psychology and dealing with uh, injury recovery? I, I still think, you know, we've gotten a lot better. And it's something that you, you talk about athletes in terms of, like, how do you feel mentally? Are you nervous? It wasn't even talked about 10, 15 years ago. So mm-hmm. I think the fact that we're having this conversation, um, you know, with athletes, I think it's important. But I still think we don't necessarily, when athletes get to this level, I think we're good when they first come back. Like, are you confident, you know, it's going to be okay? But Clay's an exact example. Just because he came back and played relatively well last year doesn't mean the mental part doesn't go away, you know, year one, year two, year three. So I still think we're a little bit behind in terms of dealing with athletes and how these injuries impact them for the rest of their career. Um, and it is interesting. Everyone says, well, you know, he came back. He played great. Well, why Why didn't he scrimmage? You know, why is he even looking off right now? And a lot of it, you know, is still the, some of the physical component, but I think the mental component is still there. It doesn't just turn off suddenly. Um, so I think that that's something that we need to consider when we're, when we're looking at clay. Um, and also just with athletes in general, when they come off injury, you know, we, they can rehab. They, we have all these great surgical techniques. But they're still human beings who are still dealing with that fear of getting injured. And it's even more for professional athletes because it's their livelihood. Doc, last question, and it's a big one. Warriors, Clippers tonight. Who plays basketball tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, tonight, just because we're talking about him, Clay Thompson plays basketball tonight. There you go. Doc Pandy. Nice. Bringing nice. it home. Yeah. Thanks, Doc. Have a great holiday. It's great to talk with you. Yeah, well, absolutely, guys. You have a good Thanksgiving as well, too. Yeah. Uh, proceeding was sponsored by UCSF Health. Yeah, 